Hello and welcome to Real Estate Live UK and our second week of virtual events. This series of webinars this week is brought to you by White Label and our sponsors and partners and we're delighted to have so many people tuning in for our sessions this week. We're looking to encourage audience participation during each of our panels. So to kick that off, we're about to launch a, po a polling question asking what is the most important factor in unlocking development and ensuring the continued strength of UK real estate? We asked a similar question of our audiences in June and we'll be sharing the results and the comparisons at the end of the week. So we'll just give everyone a short while to complete their answers. I know they're quite long, so i um, give you a second to read through those. During the session today, um, please continue to interact as much as possible. We'd like lots of audience participation, as I said, so you can do that using Zoom's Q&A feature to put questions to the panel via our chair. We've got some really fantastic speakers joining us for this session, looking at how partnership working can help get the City of London moving again. And I'd now like to introduce Giles Barry, Senior Managing Director of FTI Consulting, to begin the discussion. Giles. Bonnie, Bonnie thank you for having us all. And I am uh, sitting here in the City of London in a rather deserted office. Um, the city is, is as quiet as ever this morning, and I don't think any of us agree this is sustainable. While we've got to be mindful of the health issues, we also need to be mindful of the need to get the City of London moving again. No. And today's discussion will be about how we collectively oh, um, work to get the City of London moving, what the audience thinks we can do to get the City of London moving, because as I said, it's deathly quiet out there at the moment, and it's just not sustainable. Uh, we're going to hear from five different speakers, each going to talk for three or four minutes each, and then we're going to have a discussion amongst us. But above all, we want to have your questions from the audience. Um, one of the great things, uh, um, if there are any great things about the lockdown, is that it's um, bred uh, familiarity with digital platforms like this. They can work very, very interactively. So as Bonnie said, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function, the Q&A function on your keyboard and filter your questions through. Uh, if enough come through, we may ask them during the session, but as it is, we're gonna start with um, the, the different presentations from our panelists. Um, first up is Tom Slay from the City of London Corporation, who's going to talk about its work with bids and partnerships and how to help us recover and thrive moving out of lockdown. So. Tom, over to you first, um, and then I will um, introduce the next panellist as well. Thank you, Giles. Thank you, Giles. Uh, unfortunately, Tom couldn't make it today, um, but I, I am uh, replacing you. I'm Shravan Joshi. I'm also a member of the Court of Common Council, like Tom, and I also sit on the Property Investment Board of the City. So uh, it's, a, it's a subject that I'm more than qualified to, uh, to take on Tom's behalf. Um, so thank you, Giles. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be kicking off this session. Uh, we are discussing matters of great importance at a time when we are still battling this terrible virus. And, and while public health is paramount, it's absolutely right that we bring business leaders, politicians and others together to plan for this recovery now. Uh, the fragile recovery that we are getting underway has arguably been set back by the newest restrictions that have been announced by the government in the last week or so. But in spite of this, it is essential that the city develops innovative solutions and new strategies for keeping the economy going across the square mile. The city is the engine room of the nation's economy, and it will be essential to support the nationwide recovery that will be so important. With just 13% of the population, London is responsible for 23% of the UK's economy, and the square mile is, of course, at the beating heart of that. Our ability to evolve and innovate over the years is partly why the city is so important to the UK's economy. And one new innovation recently has been our embracing of the bid model as a key route to deliver regeneration and shared visions between the public and the private sectors. <clears throat> this was initiated first with the establishment of the Cheapside Business Alliance, and we now have a second bid in Allgate and two new partnerships, one at Fleet Street, and another focused on the tower cluster, the Eastern City Partnership. These are now on track to move to bid status within the next year or so. Collectively, these bids and partnerships cover a significant part of the City of London and represent the majority of businesses in the square mile. Traditional financial and professional services obviously make up a core element of the city, but we are also now home to media, creative and tech firms with more room for growth on the horizon. 
And we know from talking to our business community that they want their voice to be heard in a coordinated way. Business care, businesses do care passionately about the environment in which they operate. It matters for their staff, for their clients, and for their customers, and is now an essential part of them delivering against their commercial and social goals. Bids allow for greater collaboration and synergy, and crucially deliver tangible results, with the age-old mantra of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts ringing loud and true. Of course, the city has always understood the power of collective action and the vital role that businesses play in creating vibrancy. But the bid model formalizes the role that the private sector can play. The model allows, us, allows money raised via mandatory levy on business rates to be invested into the local area and facilitates collaborative working to enable shared priorities to be realized on issues like public realm, security, traffic, and air quality. If we pause for a minute to look at the Cheapside Business Alliance as our trailblazing bid in the city, it's clear to see where the value has been added over the last five years since it was established. From delivering world-class events and supporting the city corporation's aspirations for the square mile to become a 24-7 destination, to backing local business growth through work placement schemes and networking events, the work of the CBA is varied and ambitious and aligns closely with the city corporation's long-term vision. At the beginning of this year, its efforts were rewarded with a resounding success at its renewal ballot, which served to reinforce the message that this sort of collaborative approach is growing in popularity. It's great that we've got Charlotte Fletcher here, the chair of the CBA on this panel, and I know she'll be talking shortly about the work the CBA has been doing most recently to support retail and other businesses during the COVID pandemic. With more than 60 bids now operating in London alone, they are a core partner in the running of the capital. Looking significantly, looking specifically at this current crisis, bids have taken a lead role across London in the acute crisis phase, which started in March, with bids providing a vital role in communicating to businesses and offering support and guidance. Increasingly, as our attention now turns towards recovery, we're looking to bids to support the intensive work of the city corporation and add value by engaging with the business community and bring concerns and ideas to the table. Undoubtedly, the crisis is not only having a short-term impact on the city, dramatic drop in footfall and extreme pressure on the ecosystem of businesses that keep the city engine moving day in, day out, from dry cleaners to sandwich shops. But looking further ahead, we know there are going to be some long-term changes, perhaps some that would have happened anyway, but have been accelerated by the pandemic and others that we could never have envisaged just six months ago. City corporations acted swiftly throughout to be on the front foot responding to changing needs on the ground, fast-tracking ambitious transportation and public realm schemes to facilitate more social distancing and prioritizing pedestrianization and cycle lanes. Crucially, we've been working closely with our businesses to understand the impacts on their commercial operations. Whilst we're still facing challenging times, we're confident that the city is still a viable, attractive global powerhouse. There is a role for businesses to have offices in the long term and a huge need for workers to be able to collaborate and interact. The trick for us will be to once again innovate and evolve and be at the forefront of what the new world order will look like. Our work with the city bids and partnerships will enable us to do this in a robust and effective way. Together, we can ensure our actions are aligned with the needs of the businesses in our area, allowing our interventions to be amplified with us all working towards shared goals and speaking with a united voice. Lastly, we will be able to collectively showcase the great assets of the City of London, promoting it to new investors, future talent and international visitors, which will be crucial as we recover from this global pandemic. So in conclusion, we have some challenges before us, but together with the partnership model being embraced by the corporation, I think we are in the strongest position possible. The chance of the talks of the need to learn to live with the virus without fear. And in the city, we're determined to play our part in figuring that conundrum out. Thank you, Giles. Gavin, that's fantastic. Um, I, 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 I think it is crucial to live without fear. And I think the other thing that we also have to remember always about the city of London is just how long it has been here. Um, it's defied um, a number of issues over the years. We were tremendously encouraged. We worked with the City of London Corporation at our firm, FDI Consulting, to poll 
um, hundreds of global investors um, in July to talk about the long term, um, their long term impression of the city of London. And it had barely, uh, barely flickered in terms of the appeal. London is still seen as preeminent ahead of uh, New York, Hong Kong. Global investors see the long term um, the long term outlook. Um, now we just need to get over some, albeit very considerable, short term issues. So thank you for talking about um, Charlotte Shraban. Over to you, Charlotte, the chair of the Cheapside Business Alliance. I will come down your street from uh, Cannon Street every day. I'm willing it to get busier. Um, wh what can we do about it? <laughs> um, thanks, Giles. Well, yes, I'm also sitting here in the city of London. Um, it's, I can tell you it's definitely busier than it was about five or six uh, weeks ago, um, but there's still an awful lot to be done. And obviously with changing rules and regulations, we, we have to always uh, see that that will have a, a, an impact uh, variably. Um, so I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about um, the, what impact the lockdown has had on retail in the city and how the, the bids have supported them and other businesses. Um, so we all know that some sectors have been more adversely impacted due to the pandemic than others, and retail is definitely one of them. Arguably not to the same extent as hospitality and leisure, with many of those businesses still unable to operate. But nonetheless, the impact of lockdown and the prolonged restrictions and slow recovery have been profound for retail. I think if you take London, and specifically the City of London, it's perhaps even more at risk of the loss of the ecosystem of office workers and visitors in other cities heavily reliant on public transport to get our army of office workers into the centre each day and increasingly benefiting from international visitors as the city embraced its 24-7 destination vision. The city is undoubtedly hurting at the moment and you only need to walk around the square mile to see the impact. Many shops and venues still closed and still a relatively low footfall. That said, uh, I am optimistic about the future and I know from my work with the Cheapside Business Alliance and seeing the resilience and the hard work of the retailers in the district that this crisis will be overcome. Huge investment has been made by retailers to make their shops as safe and as welcoming as possible. And of course, many are innovating and changing their business models to adapt to the changing times we find ourselves in. It won't be without its casualties. The high street and retail was already changing before COVID. And I think that the pandemic has fast tracked some of the evolution that was already underway. It will be more important than ever for districts to get their offer right not only the mix of retail and hospitality, but the whole visitor worker experience. What it feels like to visit an area, how unique, special is the offer? Is it memorable and shareable? Is it somewhere that leaves you wanting more? These questions lead us to the conclusion that collaborative working is the key to our success. Businesses working hand in hand with the public sector to develop a shared vision and then deliver it. Bids are the ideal model to deliver this collective action, providing a coordinated approach to partnership working with the financial structure to enable them to bring about real change. As area custodians, bids not only focus on the major strategic issues, but also have a tangible positive impact on the operational aspects that really matter to people. Street ambassadors, enhanced street cleaning, security and wayfinding. These aren't necessarily the first things people notice when they come into an area, but they increasingly notice if they're missing. Day-to-day -day bids support the business in the area, and this has been vital during the pandemic, especially as the fragile recovery got underway. Promoting those businesses that were reopening their doors, providing clarity on the ever-changing government guidance, and ensuring our operational activities, such as ambassadors and street cleaners, were back out, providing a positive welcome to the area. These were the priority tasks for us at the Cheapside Business Alliance, and the feedback we received from our business community was overwhelmingly positive and continues to be so. From the smaller interventions to the bigger strategic vision, visions and major projects, bids across London are making a huge difference. And I strongly believe that they will be the key to how well London recovers in the longer term. Thank you. Charlotte, that's fantastic. And I think one thing we've all learned in the last few months is being organised, collaborating. Um, as we've seen the health uh, and care sectors under tremendous pressure, some people criticising them for being over-centralised, some people... Um, uh, criticising them for being um, um, just chaotic in a general sense. I think I think partnership and collaboration is what we all need to get us through this. And encouraging to hear Cheapside Business Alliance is is already hit the ground running to such an extent. Um, next to Vicky Vicky Fairhall, we're going to hear now from the development world. Um, Vicky is from Brookfield, and of course, um, amidst all this. Um, we have to bear in mind the, the, the thoughts and uh, issues facing 
real estate owners. Um, the market has gone very, very quiet, although it does seem as if there's still interest, certainly amongst the investment community in real estate in the city. Um, Vicky, what's been happening at the coal face? What's the, um, the situation as far as the resilience of the commercial sector? And how have you um, formulated in your mind ways to work with bids to get us through this? Oh, thanks, Charles. Um, I'm also in the city this morning and actually not as I, it's pretty busy around Moorgate, not too bad. And I think in terms of what we're seeing in terms of footfall numbers into our buildings, we were up to about 18 percent in um, sort of uh, in August. And then it started falling back down again and we're around about 16 percent. So it seems to have sort of plateaued at that level. Um, so I think in terms of resilience uh, of the business sector, I mean, incredibly resilient. I mean, from the moment that obviously lockdown happened and how quickly the business models changed to the working from home. And then as we got through and started lifting lockdown, you see how businesses within, I mean, particularly within our assets, that how they then sort of ad adjusted again, made their workplaces safest, safe to, to welcome people back. Um, clearly, the, the challenge has been around, uh, well, well, the clarity from the government and the guidance and, and obviously the change in the directive in the last week or so where they're encouraging people to work from home again. I mean, that is causing all sorts of problems for businesses to really encourage people back to the workplace and make them feel safe. And although I think businesses recognize how important it is to get people back into the workplace, but I mean, so many reasons, whether it's um, you know, to, to, for collaboration, creativity, uh, training and well-being of the, of their people um, and also ultimately productivity. It's just the challenges that they're facing um, to get this uh, guidance right and, and to make people feel safe coming back to the workplace. I think that's really and really where I think that the bids come into play as to how we can support uh, businesses in this short term in this challenging um, well, you know, lobbying uh, the government to make sure that they realise the uniqueness of the City of London and how we need to support the businesses um, and the clarity in that messaging and guidance is key to start getting people back into the workplace. Um, and I think really then it's the sort of more of the longer term role that the bids can play to really uh, look to the future. You know, of course, there's going to be change. There's going to be seismic change post this uh, pandemic. And it's and it's how how the bids can work collaboratively as, collaboratively as one voice um, to really su support the businesses and get that messages out there. Um, so, yeah. So, so you know. Business have been these been through this these challenges before, and they can they will again. They'll endure it, and they'll get through it, and they will recover. Um, but it's key that um, we've got this structure around the bids, working with the City of London to really support the business and and bring bring their work their their work people uh, the employees back safely. Fantastic. So yeah, a couple of observations there, Victoria. Um, I thought um, Catherine McGuinness from the City of London was tremendously impressive on the Today programme on Radio 4 week yep. before last with the actual messaging of come back to work if you if you know it's safe to come back to work and so much work has gone into making building COVID compliant that those people are um, safe coming back in um, in large part. Another uh, my eye was also drawn to some work that um, Imperial College had done for Transport for London just last week uh, where they've basically gone through the underground and taken tests and swabs, you name it, from anything that people might touch. And there is no coronavirus to be caught on the underground as long as people wear, wear masks. You can't actually catch it from touching anything, which I think was a really clever piece of, uh, of messaging. So I think certainly four or five months ago, there was a feeling that perhaps if you touch the escalator or uh, a, a rail on the tube, that that would be a problem. Um, I think if you wear a mask, um, it's, 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 you know, you, you are, you are in a good place going back onto the tube. And that's, a, that's a really crucial point. Um, next on to Alistair Subaru. Um, Alistair, you are as close as anyone to what occupiers, the people who are, um, in buildings or leasing buildings from landlords, um, are thinking, um, are they taking a rain check? What their long-term thinking? And how can um, how can bids um, galvanise everything we're talking about at the moment? 
Thank you, Giles, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, we are um, in unprecedented times, but we have to remember that this is very early days uh, in terms of um, the presence of the virus and the impact of the virus. Um, Lon the office is not dead. Uh, London is still open for business. There are difficult mixed messages coming out of the government in terms of come back to work or work at home, uh, which Vicky re referred to. Um, and we also have to remember uh, the impact of cost on making buildings COVID compliant and that sweeping statement of work from home uh, has used up quite a significant amount of money that's basically been poured into buildings to make them uh, clean and safe to use. Um, what I'm seeing uh, on the ground in terms of tenant demand is broken down into a number of different areas. Um, we believe that there is business plan first and property second. So business plans are busy being rewritten at the moment to cater for what's going on here. But ultimately, uh, there is significant demand uh, for offices in the square mile in central London, millions of square feet. What you do have to do is to break that down into actually how real is that demand? Is it aspirational? Because from a market point of view, um, landlords don't want voids now. So they're working even harder given vacancy rates are rising in London. Uh, they're working much harder to keep tenants. Uh, we went into this pandemic on the basis of low vacancy rates, uh, significant rental growth, uh, and very limited new and newly refurbished space being around for occupiers effectively to uh, adhere to their business plan, which was to move to new functional space. And I believe that some of those business plans still exist. The tenants that I've been talking to still want to achieve uh, a relocation. The big question is how much? How much space do I need now? Because what the pandemic has done is it's sped up the actual use of agile working, but it hasn't replaced coming to the office. There are still people who need to be there. So when we talk about reduced demand, it's probably a reduced size demand. It's an appropriately sized demand, but actually there, there are still deals being done. Um, there are either corporate deals that were in the offering that still need to be done. Um, we have to remember that from a business plan point of view, there are a number of people looking to move from multiple floors onto single floors. Uh, that's part of their business plan. They're looking from old space to new space. There's still a number of people in central London occupation sitting in quite tired space. And therefore, there is going to be a flight to quality. Uh, there is going to be a flight to location, how easy it is for me to get my staff in and out of central London. And there is going to be a flight to flexibility, because what we do know is that however much space I take today isn't necessarily going to be how much I need tomorrow, because we are still very early in the days of establishing what real requirements are. Um, the workplace consultants are working incredibly hard, uh, trying to um, work through the functionality of an office, uh, coupled with maybe the one, two, possibly three days working from home. Um, we've got to remember succession planning in how people come to an office and they learn. We've got to remember collaboration that's been talked about a lot in terms of how we talk as teams. So there is no one size fits all. And I honestly believe that there are significant number of inquiries out there that will keep what we call the churn going. Um, there is a requirement for landlords to uh, start to um, increase Cat A plus space being released. Uh, because the banks clearly are going to have an eye on lending money, which is the traditional route for fitting out premises offset against rent-free periods. But actually, some of the banks don't particularly want to lend that money now. So landlords with good balance sheets are going to start to offer Cat A plus finished space. And that team equally is going to have an impact on the serviced office sector. Because the serviced office sector, if you look at some of the offerings from the main um, providers, 
are still trying to work on a one per five square meters, 50 square feet basis. And that simply doesn't work if you look at their numbers. But we have, um, we have a churn. We have statistics that show we're significantly down as take up, that vacancy rates are going to grow. So the market will reach its level. But provided we have good quality space in good locations, if you happen to be in 50,000 square feet and you now need 25,000 feet, you still need 25. If you're in 10 and need five, you still need five. Um, it's how we mature the marketplace to allow for um, uh, that demand to fit into the business plans of what is predominantly an SME market operational at the moment. Turning to the, the bids and the role, um, as you know, I've been involved in bids for about 25 years when they were LIPS. They were local improvement partnership schemes um, before they became business improvement districts. They are a private and public initiative to basically get area uh, stewardship. And bids have an amazing role to play. Uh, we started with six of them in London, five of them in London, sorry. Uh, we've now got over 50 in London and over 300 around the country. Uh, they help enormously in terms of public consultation. Uh, they help the local authorities bring schemes forward for public realm improvements, transport strategies. They help with the interface with Transport for London. We get wider pavements. We get cycle uh, um, lanes. Um, but on top of that, we have the energy and enthusiasm between the bid companies uh, with their stakeholders that are providing uh, destination marketing. They're providing the invigorative uh, support for local businesses, retailers, restaurants, bars, clubs, uh, all sorts of uh, retail trade, as well as promoting the they're sort of they're the modern day uh, chamber of commerce that is really invigorating local stewardship. And it is a battle of the bids because actually all the bids are fighting for um, the occupiers to come into their area, which is really healthy. And one of the things that I've enjoyed, having worked with the North Bank bid and the Hatton Garden bid and the Midtown bid, is the embracing of the city corporation to the future of bids and our very own Fleet Street Quarter Partnership, which we are just uh, launching. Um, we have the newspaper industry buildings, which were reoccupied by Goldman Sachs and various professional consultants. And we have a 9 million square foot fl footprint in that Fleet Street Ludgate Hill corridor that we're going to go up against all of the other bids to prove that we're the best location in the centre of London with Crossrail and City Thameslink. And the bid has got a massive role to play in area regeneration. So really exciting times for London. And when we're down about London, we've got to remember it's been not a number of times over the last three or four decades, you know, and it is resilient and it does fight back. And uh, if we all come together, we will get London back to where it was pre-lockdown. That's a fantastic, stirring stuff. I think it is interesting, isn't it? Um, when you think about London, um, New York City is exactly as quiet as London at the moment. This isn't a London only issue. This is an issue that big cities all around the world have to um, uh, put their minds to, to solving. Um, and I think the more we hear about it, thank goodness for the bids um, that do exist and are being formed because it gives us this great platform to collaborate in terms of getting things moving again. Um, we had quite a few questions from the audience and we'll go to those in a minute. But next up and our final speaker is Ian Mulcahy, um, who's from Gensler. Ian's also chair of the Aldgate bid. Um, Ian, let's, let's hear more about how um, the, the city's infrastructure and general framework and public realm might change going forward and also your, your impressions on, on, on what you may have heard so far. No, I, I think there's been a fascinating conversation about how you uh, encourage people back to the office. And, I'd, and I say office because I think there's a there's a kind of a view out there that perhaps people aren't working. I think people are working from home and are very, very busy from home. And I think the question that a lot of organizations are asking is, is it as good for my business 
if I move people from their home environment back to their office environment? And I think a lot of businesses are continually trying to weigh up uh, that that debate. And um, I think one of the things we're seeing is I think there are certain things uh, actually people are finding they can do very, very efficiently from home and will probably carry on doing efficiently uh, from home in the future. But there's a lot of other things that people still need to do um, and they're struggling to do perhaps at home. And I think one of the things we're now focused on, both as a, a, a business ourselves, but also the Old Gate Connect bid, which is what are the things that we really need from the office? So what are the things that will help our businesses uh, move forward? And I think it's this thing about we need a place to meet we need a place uh, to share things. We need a place to socialize. Um, we need a place that we can teach and educate uh, uh, our staff uh, and those next generation uh, workers uh, coming up. And I think those are all things that uh, we're struggling to do, actually, uh, in that sort of lockdown world in our office. Um, and uh, hence, I think a lot of people have been a little bit more reticent about coming back than many of us thought. But I think I think all of those are clues as to what the city needs to provide for people in the future. I think, um, and I think we've just talk, talked uh, earlier about this more agile way of working. I don't think it is a an analog debate about I work from home or I work from the office. Actually, I think people are finding they can work from lots and lots of different locations, but they need an environment to do these very particular things. And the city provides that environment. That's its purpose. Um, its purpose isn't so you can go into work and check your emails. The purpose is so you can meet and socialize and share and network with people. And I think there'll be, there's going to be a lot of focus now on making sure the city's doing that for us in the right way. So I think the design of public realm, access to public realm is going to be very, very important. I think the quality of environment, so I can move from one place to the other without feeling like I'm in a crowd or feeling like like it's congested, I think is going to be very important. And I think bids have a role to play. They're, they're listening uh, to the needs of business and they're able to uh, uh, work with and collaborate with uh, local authorities um, and, and, and other organizations who are a key stakeholders in, in all of this. But my sense is I, I am optimistic. I do think London has a massive role to play, but I think business is proving incredibly resilient. They've adapted the way they've been working for, in many cases, generations overnight to a, a new way of working. And I think that's also given a clue as to the future of how we might work uh, and the future role of the city centre and the future role uh, of all the offices that many of us uh, now occupy. And I, I'm super excited because I think it changes the nature of that, but perhaps changes it in a, in a positive way, uh, not, a, uh, not a negative way. But I think the big thing, uh, I think all of us are looking to, you know, whether we're going to come back in uh, droves in, in October or, or November probably doesn't really matter. Um, but I do think the way we come back, uh, the way we utilize our, our city is going to be different. Um, and I think people are going to be looking for more balance, balance in their lives generally, um, but also balance between actually where I live in relationship to where I do my work and my work in a, in a much broader, more general way. And I think this idea that actually our bid, Oldgate uh, uh, bid, straddles both the city and part of Tower Hamlet. And actually what's interesting about that area, it has a very big residential population in addition to a very big uh, office population. And I think we're already hearing from certain businesses that people who live in those locations are actually much more enthusiastic about going uh, back, to the, back to the office to do their work because it's close by. And I think there's a real clue in there trying to get a better balance of living and working in not just in central London, but I think in cities and communities across the country. 
Yeah, and that's fantastic. So just a couple of questions from me before we go to the audience's ones. I mean, I think what's really one of the things that you said that was interesting was people not wanting to go into the office just to check their emails. Um, one thing personally I've noticed is I get so many more emails from yeah, colleagues. Now. I mean, I'd rather just be talking to them than, than grinding through the email. It's amazing when you go through them at the end of the day, there's sort of, yes, got it. Thank you. Wow. Brilliant. You know, and that that's not not what working life is all about is looking at I emails. totally totally agree and I love Esther Ranson's current campaign about you know a phone calls worth a kind of a thousand emails or a thousand text messages and I'd go further in one five minute conversation you can do a hundred emails do you know what I mean in terms mm -hmm. of its communication value and I actually think that's why sessions like this where again would we have done this to the degree we have uh, uh, we are doing now in in video conferencing where we're talking together not reading pamphlets or documents um, is so interesting because I, I agree with you uh, people human interaction it is the premium experience and and that is going to be the thing that's going to draw everyone back to the city center the human physical experience of interaction mm. whether that be going to the theater or going to a gallery or attending a meeting in a building uh, or socializing together. And that's where we have to focus our attention uh, as to how to make, uh, and I love the term flight to quality because that, that is going to be the trend. People are going to have the choice to move to better buildings in better environments uh, and offering a better quality uh, uh, of place to do their business. Okay, so as I said, I've got a couple of questions. Um, Shravan, first, um, thank you very much for your your presentation there. How how for people who haven't perhaps been into into London for a few months, um, how do you think they'll feel coming back into the city? What might they see? What might they see that is different? Uh, and what what other um, measures you, will you be putting into place to encourage those people uh, to come back to to the city? Thanks, Charles. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, first of all, I've got to say what an optimistic bunch we all are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see so much faith in in um, in, in bids and in the city. Um, I, I think the most obvious visible changes that people will see um, as, as they emerge out of you know, transport hubs or as they enter the square mile is going to be the road layouts have changed completely. Um, you know, the city's been renowned for for centuries for having small alleyways and 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 you know limited access uh, through through these very small channels, these rat runs. Um, that has changed significantly, and and you know we've put in place social distancing measures. Pavements are wider. Um, we've put in cycling lanes um, to to uh, encourage people to use active transport where they can. Um, and, and you will see a number of sort of one way road systems in place for, for motor vehicles. And, and so the idea is that as people do start to get confidence to come back um, using active transport where they can, they should be coming into a, a safe and, and secure environment uh, where they can socially distance and, and keep to the government guidelines. Um, the other aspect of course, is the work we're trying to do with TFL and the government to, uh, encourage a message around the safety that, that the train network has. And, and, and as you mentioned, you know, the, the idea that, um, you know, surfaces don't seem to be as, as, um, as, as relevant to transmission as perhaps the, the, the air around us. Um, you know, it's messages like that that we need to get clear and concise and unified to people to say, you know, actually the train network is safe to use, it is clean. And you're only going to get a critical mass of people back once you've got them using that that mass transport system. OK, and then I've got um, one for the two property experts, Vicky and Alistair. Um, Vicky, I think it's really interesting. Um, Ian just used the term flight to quality. Um, what does this mean for the difference between grade A, grade B, grade C type offices? Because as Alistair said, there may be a smaller amount of demand. But... What, what, what you do create had better be good, if you like. I mean, what, what, how, how do you think we'll see the office of the future looking and what the demand might be might be for? Yeah, I think there will be the, the growing gap between um, grade A and B and C space, just because, as you say, this flight to quality, if you're going to have space, if you're going to have office space, it's got to be the best space because that's going to be really key to attract um, 
labor etc to your to your company so i think it's definitely going to be looking to okay being more efficient with space but then also making sure it's the best space that they can acquire um and so we're really looking at future proofing our space so really looking at uh, not just the pandemic itself and, and the impact on the design of offices that the pandemic will have, but also looking at other future disruptors to, to business and how um, office design will evolve in order to accommodate that and make it more resilient. So I can, you know, I, I, I echo the, the, the flight to quality piece, but I think it's, it's up to us as, as developers and landlords to really look at how we can future proof the design of offices to make sure that they are resilient and they are capable for for what our clients occupiers want in the future i think i've had enough of disruption for one year but but what (laughs) what what might be the next what might be the next ones that you're thinking about well i mean i think that's an interesting um presentation from fosters and partners and they're they're working for sort of global companies looking at um you know civil unrest uh future pandemics how other pandemics might come um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not just, I mean, the last few months has not just been a pandemic that's, that's hit the, the, the world. There's plenty of other things that have been unrest that has been occurring. And it's really how uh, the workplace is going to future proof and accommodate uh, future disruptors, not just the pandemic. OK, um, Alistair, uh, you know, as as um, senior partner of Fairbrother, as you say, you're at the heart of the London market. Um, also as vice chair for the Fleet Street Quarter, this this change in what, what property might be developed, because I, I'm surrounded by some brilliant buildings. They're just not going to be empty, but maybe there's some some smaller ones, some some older ones that may may have to have a different future. I, I think they do have a um, they have to be analysed on the basis that um, they might not be fit for purpose for um, the office market of the future. Um, we're all doing quite a bit of research at the moment as to what does the occupier want. And it's not just all about the big occupier, it's the smaller occupiers as well. Um, I think if you start from the premise where your, your lease asset is, a, is, a, is an asset to the business, it's actually performing, it's doing something for the business. It's either staff retention, client retention, client um, uh, additions, in attracting new talent, one's got to then look at that asset as a, as an asset as opposed to a liability. I know the accountants on this um, webinar would say actually a lease is a liability to the business, but we really take it back to the basics and saying, right, so my staff coming in, my, my colleagues coming into work, what is it that they want when they get there? It's not just dull, boring office space. It's got to be engaging. The amenities need to pro- provide um, a home from home type hoteling. Um, and I think what's, what's evolving at the moment is this greater degree of thought behind, I'm a landlord and I've got a cus- customer, not a tenant that's paying me rent. So how do I keep that rental flow? What is it's gonna, what can I do to help their business? And we're starting to see the evolving of um, concierge services, proper ones. We've got WhatsApp groups between tenants in the building. There's running clubs, there's movie nights, there's beer nights when we're allowed. There's all sorts of things going on, which is making the office uh, a destination for not just work, but for uh, enjoyment as well. Um, And yes, people will work from home, but... I think you're going to start to see some buildings that don't provide the basis. And depending upon which local authority you're based in, there will be a greater or lesser degree of planning brief and the local development framework allowing for change of uses for those parts of um, the building. You know, there has been a resistance within central London to residential, conversions to residential, there's going to be an enormous amount of pressure in a desire to create a more cosmopolitan environment of live, work, play type recipe is that where is the residential component going to come from? We've got lots more educational establishments, student accommodation, you know, not those 18 year olds out of school, but some mature students. We've got LSE, we've got King's, we've got UCL, you know, you've probably got Harvard and Stanford and a number of the American universities. 
wanting to come to London as well. And the innovations, you know, that uh, Cambridge innovations where people are coming and uh, creating things um, from an entrepreneurial point of view. So I think flexibility, flexibility of space, flexibility of lease arrangements um, and creating nice collaborative spaces, warming, engaging spaces will, will be a really good part of the ingredients of a vibrant city going forward. Okay. Thanks, Alice. So we're going to go to some of the questions now from the um, audience. Um, an interesting one from um, um, Mikola Wilson, who is a well-known property expert. Hello, Mikola. Um, Mikola says, we've heard a lot about the impact of the pandemic um, on the hospitality industry, but do we know what the impact has been on financial services and banking, etc.? Has productivity dropped dramatically? If it has, will this be the economic driver to get people back into the city? Um, Ian, as a, as a workplace expert, I'm going to put this one to you because um, I'm always interested when people say they're much more productive from home. I don't know if they how they know they're more productive because as I say, a lot of it just involves sending lots and lots of emails. Um, you know, is there something that can be done or that the city or the bids can do to show how productive the workplace or the traditional workplace is? What, what, what could be done to prove it's this great fusion that I think we all, we all know it is? I think, again, I think a lot of these trends we could see well developing or developing very well before COVID. I think there was already a big push for a greater degree of agility in the workplace and people were voting with their feet. You already saw it in the ridership numbers that TFL were getting on the tube, that people were staying away from peak hour travel. They were actually starting to work from home one day a week or two days a week. And you could see that process already beginning and technology really enabling that to happen in a way that perhaps wasn't a, it wasn't really possible uh, a few years ago. I think the question about whether people are more productive in that environment or not just depends on so many different factors. And again, we're doing a lot of survey work of organizations to try and understand that. And I think that has to do with your home environment as much as your work environment. Are you able to work from home in the way that you are able to work uh, uh, from the office. And some people are finding it much easier. And some people actually, particularly younger people and people with young families are finding it much more difficult in some respects. So I think you, it, there is no simple, uh, uh, again, no simple analog that one is better than the other. But I think what people are craving is flexibility. They're actually saying, actually, some days it works for me at home, some days it works for me in the office, some years it may work for me in the office, some years it may work for me at home. And I, I think it's very different in different fields. What we do see is um, uh, uh, that a lot of businesses, particularly technology businesses, who uh, have actually been expanding, hiring, and their business growing throughout uh, the last few months, not necessarily contracting. Um, and again, that must mean that they're able to run their business productively, and they must see uh, a bigger and bigger demand for their services. And I think uh, I think I look at our own business, we have 6,000 people globally working from home. And actually, it's proving pretty good. I don't think it's really under, undermining our productivity in any meaningful way. But we're not meeting with each other. We're not socializing with each other. And we're not inviting people into our office to engage with us. So I think there's a there's a long-term implication of what we're going through. And I think a long-term aspiration is to try and have a, a much more graduated, much more nuanced approach to the way we work. Um, and I think um, many, many businesses are now exploring that actively. Um, very few businesses we're talking to are talking about moving 100% of their staff back to the office 100% of the time. Very, very few. Okay. All right. We've got one from uh, Duncan Ray now, who says, it's interesting to hear bids being positioned in this discussion in terms of inward investment and area regeneration. The departure from bids origins as consumer and destination marketing. How would a bid approach this differently to a local authority? Um, I mean, obviously, Charlotte, you're working alongside the, the Corporation of London. Um, but do you think are we seeing are we seeing um, or will this create a, a change in the way bids um, operate? Do you think? 
I think bids have evolved uh, greatly. Um, you know, Alistair was talking about when his first involvement uh, with them was and, and how many we have now. And I think uh, there were obviously specific requirements and needs of why they, they came about and started, but I definitely think that they evolve. And I think it's crucial, you know, we talk about collaboration, but, you know, particularly with Cheapside, that, you know, that partnership with the City of London Corporation, and it has to be a partnership with the various local authorities. And it's like, right, what, you know, what are the areas that the local businesses need that can't be, um, you know, immediately covered by a local authority? And then it's the businesses, you know, combining, communicating, collaborating, you know, obviously, you know, financing as well, um, and to to then deliver exactly what they want. And I think actually the the retail um, within the city of London working, obviously, you know, they're, they're the supply and demand, they're fed by the, the office workers and the visitors. So it's got to be an understanding of what's needed, what's wanted, and then delivering on that. You know, things like, you know, the additional um, public realm, the widening of the, of the, of the pavements, the, um, the green spaces, you know, quite few and far between in the city, but actually there's quite a lot of them. And the, you know, the City of London Corporation, you know, look after those and, and support those, but then the, the Cheapside Business Alliance actually promote them. You know, here's where they are. We're going to, you know, let people know we're going to do a walking guided audio tour of the best green spaces in London. We're going to put some art installations, you know, in certain little squares and pockets of, of um, you know, of green space. And it's those kind of things that really just add to the space and make it thrive and for people to realize what you know what a great place to be it is so i think you know i think that's where you know they may have started out being for one specific reason but i think now the the use and the benefit of the bids is quite wide ranging okay um i've got just one more question before we go to some concluding remarks it's been a, a say plenty coming in um one for you shravan uh, this is from an anonymous attendee who says are local planning authorities really prepared to accept flexibility in their current policies it would appear that different sections in the planning departments have conflicting views e.g changing the use of listed buildings versus maintaining surplus office spaces what can the panel panel do to influence these views i mean shravan it's a tricky question but i suppose what the, the anonymous um, questioner was saying can, can local authorities be flexible enough in, in, in a time like this when you've also got um, other bigger bigger forces and, and restrictions to think about Thanks Giles and, and uh, yeah you, you know, it's a, it, it is a challenge look uh, it's, it's not an easy one uh, we've I mean, in the city of London particularly I think uh, we've got a high concentration of, of heritage buildings um, you know that that that's what makes the city the city, and and you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know you've got to be able to maintain that heritage, that culture, um, those aspects of, of the city that make it what it is and has done over the centuries, um, and yet keep a, a, an eye on the future. Um, so it is a very very difficult balancing act. Of course you're going to get conflicting views between officers, between members, between all stakeholders. Everyone's going to have an opinion on this, and and so they should. Uh, and they should be able to air those and voice those. The, the, and I'll answer this in the context of another question that I saw popping up as well around, should we allow car use in to encourage people into the square mile? And, and you know, I, I think one of the impacts that we are at risk of throwing away here is things like climate strategy. Things where we have taken a broader, longer term view and said we've got to address these matters as a matter of urgency, like climate. Um, we, we run the risk of saying, well, actually, because of the pandemic, let's just scrap all of that and get on with it and knock it all down. We've got to be careful that, that we don't lose sight of longer term aims uh, and we don't want to lose the values that we have uh, simply because of a short term strategy. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. OK, well, I'm going to ask one last question, um, which is what do you think will be the key factor in getting people back to the city? Uh, I'm going to ask everyone around the uh, around the panel. Um, going to go in reverse order from which they spoke. So, Ian from um, Gensler and chair of the bid, 
I think it's people feeling. I, I think people feeling comfortable, people feeling safe to travel, safe when they get there, and and also people feeling like there's a purpose that they're not going in because they have to go in or because people have told them to go in. They're going in. And they're volunteering to go in because they're thinking, "Oh, this is so good! I can actually meet people again, I can connect with people again, and I can do things again." Um, and I just think, uh, I, I think, I think it, it will come. I think, it, my own view, it will come probably in the spring, uh, as people starting to feel better about things and the the sun's coming out again. But I, I, I think people will collectively feel a sense of comfort together. Um, and I just think you've just got to. I think we just all got to be patient. We've all got to keep working at uh, making the uh, the the offices feel safer, look safer, and be safer. But also the public transport systems, and then the public realm, uh, and the way we can move around streets in a safe manner. And I think you'll just generally feel a a, gra a gradual relaxation and a sense of of comfort in everybody's minds. Okay, Alistair, what do you think is the key? Uh, the key factor? I think I, I agree with a lot of what Ian has said. Um, I think we're a data-driven society, so we'll need to see some reduction in cases, numbers, and so forth, and we will that, that will follow routes of periods of lockdown. Um, we've all been talking about the availability of a vaccine coming in. The vaccine, when it's here, will uh, create some degree of uh, safe feeling. Um, going back to Ian's point about coming back into the city, I, I, I've been in the city many times, continue to do so each week, and therefore, actually, I feel personally that the underground has never been cleaner. 30 yeah. years as a commuter, mm -hmm. it's actually really nice to be on the underground. Mm -hmm. The trains are clean as well. Um, so I think data, uh, a bit of, um, we're a bit of a lemming society, so we'll see more people coming back uh, the bids need to encourage more opening of some of the retail offerings because, you, you know, our society is about getting out there and having a cup of coffee and a sandwich and socialising. We're a very good London society. So it'll be a blend of things, but it has to start with, I feel safe to travel in, I feel safe being there. And I, sus I suspect it will be data-driven as a result of that. But in the meantime, you know, we, we're... Um, saying to people, come in, you know, if you feel safe to do so. You have to be very careful these days in terms of uh, the legal and the HR implications of um, making people come back to work. But you should want to go back to work. One of the fears I have across London is that the not being in work turns from being um, uh, encouraged by the government to work from home to being habitual. And once it moves to a habitual stage, then we have to find the encouragement the dig deep for people to come back in and break that habit of being at home. Okay. Vicky, what's your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I mean, I very much agree with what's already been said. It's, um, you know, safety is critical, getting building people's confidence back and particularly in the public transport. Um, it's a sort of slightly chicken and egg situation. We talk about the sort of the future of offices, what people want from offices, being able to meet and collaborate and socialise. But actually, when people get in and they realise that people aren't here, then they're going to go, well, what's the point of being in right. the office? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, critical that we get that, that mass, critical mass of people back into the city so people can really see the benefit of, of coming, coming to the office and being in the city. Yeah, I'm in a team of 30. And then one day last week, there was nine of us. And it was, I can't tell you how, how, how good it was just to, just to have that sort of efficiency uh, yeah. of shouting across the office to someone. Um, Charlotte, over to you. What's the big, um, what's the big question? Um, what will be the key factor in getting people back to the city? Yeah, again, agree with, with the other panellists. Um, in terms of, an, I suppose, from a retail um, and sort of, you know, leisure, food and beverage um, outlook, um, safety as well. So I know that CBA have been working and piloting a, a kind of a COVID accreditation scheme um, so that both businesses, local, smaller businesses in particular, can feel that they have ticked all the boxes. They've done everything within their power. You know, the Environmental Health, Health Agency has sort of signed off to say that they are doing everything they can to provide a safe environment for their customers. Um, and I think those kind of things will, you know, 
sticker in the window, COVID accredited, whatever whatever that sort of comes to be after the pilot, I think that will help greatly. Um, and I also think as, as lots of people have, have spoken about in terms of quality, I always talk about in retail, um, the changes that have been happening that have just been sped up over the last six months, but actually been happening over the last sort of 10 years. Um, you've got to look at convenience and experience. Uh, ideally you have both, but you better have one or the other. You know, customers, office workers, everyone is, you know, you know, is has far higher expectations of, of what they want. Um, and they, you know, they have data, they have lots and lots of options. So you really have to be able to give somebody that experience, whether it's just a you know them by name and you know what sandwich they have every day, to something just so quick and easy that it, it's you know it's seamless. So I think experience and convenience are going to be uh, key for uh, for getting the retail back in the city. Okay, and with the last word before I hand back to our um, back to Bonnie, um, Shravan, you kicked us off. Um, what do you think will be the key factor in getting people back into the city? Yeah, so I'm not going to repeat what everyone said. I absolutely agree with them. The, the the one thing I will say, I think the critical piece here is communication, and the only way you're going to get confidence and trust in people is to have strong, unified communication, and that's got to come from the top. Um, having the, the, you know, almost mapping out the journey for employees from the moment they leave home to the moment they get to work, the moment they sit down at their desk, in mapping that out for people, making it really clear what that safe route to work is, is really critical. And, and uh, you know, having sort of blanket policies across the entire country just, just seems a very, very blunt tool. And, and we kind of need to get the private sector, the public sector, public health all working together to get that communication bang on. Okay. Um, Bonnie, back to you. I think you've got some more Real Estate Live messages you want to uh, pick up on, but I've certainly found that encouraging, um, very encouraging panel. I hope we can all meet up again face-to-face -face soon, whether it's in the next few months or next spring, but I've, I've, I've found that really interesting. So Bonnie, back to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Giles. And thanks to our panel um, and to the City of London and the Bids and Business Partnerships for bringing this session together. Um, really interesting discussion, fascinating to see how it's moved on from our first event in June and yeah, definitely a very big fan of the optimism that was shared. So thank you all for joining us. Um, next up this afternoon, as part of the Real Estate Live programme, we have a panel on Waltham Forest, which is happening immediately now and one on Croydon. But if you're interested in hearing more on the City of London, they're hosting two further sessions with us later this week. Um, all, data, all details of those are on the Real Estate Live website and we hope to see you at one, if not all of those events. Uh, in the next few days so yeah thank you again to our panel and our sponsors and Giles for chairing it was a really great discussion thank you